So I'm glad to have the opportunity and thank you for having the opportunity to present to uh, your, our colleagues at the conference uh, virtual. Um, so what I'll be discussing to come to the theme of the presentation is uh, some ideas that relate to what is emerging in research and our research as well uh, regarding uh, going beyond industry 4.0, which is the uh, digital uh, manifestation or instantiation, if you wish, uh, of the digital transformation process in business and society to talk about industry and society 5.0, the next step. And that is more focusing on a balanced, uh, more balanced perhaps, uh, design and architecture uh, between human and technocentric uh, issues. Digital transformation and industry 4.0 have been mostly about the technical aspects of making things more efficient by digitalizing them. At the same time, if you think about it, this constitutes a process of filtering, converting the analog into the digital uh, binary, uh, one zero, and uh, cutting out, filtering out the, the nuances. This is a very important issue for people that are effectively were anal an analog beings. They're not, we're not digital. And, and many other aspects that are effectively important to our quality of life and, and, uh, and existence. Uh, this is an important issue. In connection with this, it's the issue of uh, what we exist in. We don't exist in a vacuum or some kind of digital space, uh, thank God, at this point. So the reality that uh, how democratic or not, how representative or not, how responsive or not our societies and economies are to all of us that are members of these societies and economies, the citizens, is a very important aspect. And digitalization, uh, along with the positive uh, aspects to it, creates things like digital divides that can enhance economic, cultural, and uh, even gender divides. So that, that is part of the picture. The quadruple and quintuple innovation mix are frameworks that we have developed, I and colleagues, over the last 15, 20 years to make sure that we emphasize the role of civil society and the importance of the environment when we design policies and practices. It extends and expands the triple helix uh, construct, which, which is government first industry and a top-down approach to include civil society, fourth dimension, fifth being the environment. So we want truly inclusive and sustainable uh, actions, initiatives, and policies in this regard. Now, Machiavelli talked about innovation centuries ago. This is a truth that uh, is very resilient across time, persists and prevails often. It's an uphill battle, and this is not something that people should forget when they try to bring about change, in fact, in whatever context, certainly uh, in a commercial entrepreneurial context, but also in other contexts as well. Um, <clears throat> what is industry 4.0 that I mentioned already? It's a combination of technological modalities and technologies and applications, artificial intelligence being an important ingredient there, and actually, it's the bridge to industry and society 5.0. Then also you have, uh, you know, big data analytics, augmented reality, uh, additive, molecular, if you wish, manufacturing, um, the inter Internet of Things, uh, autonomous systems, and of course cybersecurity and many other modalities. All of these are not existing in again in islands. They are integrated increasingly, and this is also part of the opportunity, but also the challenge. So system integration is at the heart of it. As I mentioned, the industry 5.0, this is where we go into a more uh, human-centric uh, mindset. And this is where we try to build on technology and, and leverage artificial intelligence applications and modalities to allow for technology to become more pervasive and at the same time to become more transparent less intrusive, hopefully. Of course, there's always the other side, as we know well, the Faustian aspect of technology where we can have a big brother and it's already happening in many parts of the world. That is exactly why and where the quadruple and quintuple helix respect and recognition um, for civil society and the environment are very important um, because otherwise we end up in some kind of toxic 
digital cloud. Um, the Society 5.0 uh, started originated in, in Japan uh, mostly a few years ago because of their uh, aging society. And this is a, a complement to Industry 5.0, of course, and it highlights even more so the human centric uh, approach. We see here the evolution across time of the different societies, if you wish, or society paradigms from um, hunting and gathering to today, which increasingly the optimistic aspect or, or perspective on this is that we will increasingly have time and opportunity and prosperity enough to be creative and deal with our hobbies rather than our necessities. Now, in reality, as with industry 4.0, if you look over the planet, not just a few developed countries and actually more so a few developed parts or the more developed advanced parts of, of some most developed countries. This is really still uh, more of a dream than a reality. And this is the challenge and opportunity is whether and the extent to which we could facilitate and incentivize some type of uh, transformation of the transformation, if you wish, leapfrogging to not just uh, replicate and repeat in that sense, both the, the successes, but also the errors and the failures of the technocentric approach with the digital transformation, but try to learn from past experiences and recent experiences and uh, have a more intelligent approach in dealing with artificial intelligence. So that's what the industry and society 5.0 are about. Uh, and hopefully that will actually provide more optimistic or more positive uh, aspects to, to the results of this transformation. We also see here the different aspects of technological application contexts, whether it's FinTech or biotech and what have you. The uh, uh, pandemic in that sense is an interesting theme to ponder for a moment because what has happened is a true uh, revolution uh, apparently in the preparation and development of vaccines, uh, a tenfold acceleration in the, uh, in this, you know, the speed and acceleration of innovation effects in how fast and how effectively and, and the, there's a, the variety of vaccines that have been developed. At the same time, uh, we are all, if you think about it, uh, guinea pigs in a global experiment uh, as we're get, getting vaccinated aside from the instances of problems and even deaths that are very few indeed, we still don't have long-term effects uh, manifested and studied, especially regarding the uh, messenger RNA technology that is truly new. So that, that's something that we need to be mindful of. And so the different technologies as they happen, they change our reality and they give us of course a tremendous respite and an opportunity to continue our lives despite the persistence of the vaccine or of the of the, the virus and the pandemic thanks to the vaccines but actually this is still not clear how it will play out over the long run um so a few comments on the quadruple and quintuple helix concepts uh, it is a systemic perspective for knowledge and innovation it is uh, how where and how we get uh integrated designs um and interlinking basic research and applied research. And the important uh, practices or modalities that, or aspects that concern this is the coexistence, if you read these verbs, coexist, compete, collaborate and compete, co-specialize and co-evolve, co-learn and co-create. So you have a process where you coexist within ecosystems if you wish, of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship as it may apply. And in general, you coexist in environments where you are uh, interacting and to some extent interlinked and interdependent with other stakeholders. And in that process, you collaborate and compete because of scarce resources, opportunities, and perhaps um, converging and, and, and conflicting even uh, objectives and priorities. And then in the process, you change, you're transformed, you specialize in a way that makes it most effective and efficient for you to operate for a period of time at least. And through that process, you evolve into a different uh, somewhat entity and, and as 
the learning takes place and along with all the other stakeholders um, you create and then you evolve further and you move to the next level this is this is where uh, both scientific technological but also artistic endeavor and behavior is manifested and uh, contributes to the uh, uh, prosperity and the uh, advancement of the ecosystems that are operating along this uh, along this uh, uh, framework, um, recognizing and supporting the four strands that we'll look at next of the quadruple helix, and of course all of them being within the environment, the fifth strand or dimension. Um, what this uh, implies and requires is that there is a democracy of knowledge, as you see here, meaning that the stakeholders are both informed, engaged, and interested in uh, contributing and also influencing and shaping uh, how things uh, evolve. And therefore, uh, democracy uh, in, in, the, in the foundational uh, traditional sense, but also in a very uh, applied and also digital manner is very uh, is a sine qua non it's very significant and important to have as well as environmental sensitivity we need to be uh, promoting activities and as I said policies and practices that are mindful and and sensitive to civil society and also the environment so you see here the three constructs or frameworks starting with the triple helix and the extensions and expansions evolutions of this into the quadruple and the quintuple helix concepts. And uh, <clears throat> the related underlying uh, economies and societies are knowledge economy at the core and then knowledge society and knowledge democracy and then social ecology as we go outwards. Uh, an industry perspective, this is from Intel Corporation on the quadruple helix, they're using it in their activities and operations and, and planning, especially in government affairs interacting with universities and with uh, public sector uh, and also NGOs. This is a, a perspective from the Fraunhofer uh, system of research centers uh, based in Germany, but also in other countries. Um, a more gyroscopic three-dimensional view where it reveals the different over overlaps and areas of focus across different components of this uh, construct or framework uh, in the five dimensions or strands. Um, and then in a more uh, practical applied sense, how that could be uh, implemented to guide uh, decisions and to guide choices, cho making choices and taking action and making decisions. The, 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 the linking of uh, the five strands or the five dimensions of the double helix with um, applications that relate to industry and society 5.0 context um, and for instance smart cities development um, and uh, models of decision making that take into account multiple priorities so multiple criteria decision analysis this is what the mcda stands for and this is a snapshot of research that is uh, already ongoing and there is already publications on that that i'm happy to share uh, if people are interested. Um, <clears throat> in connection with industry and society 5.0, there is this uh, concept of risk management 5.0 that I think is very important. And that really means that as we develop artificial intelligence applications, whether it's about data analytics, but also semantics and um, uh, deep learning, we have the ability to fine tune uh, to a great extent our capacity for trade-offs our capacity for um, effectively taking higher, uh, undertaking higher risks to pursue higher rewards um, in a manner that is non-obvious and counterintuitive. And this is something that is already being embedded in many technological applications that uh, underlie the digital transformation processes, but also can be further uh, advanced, enhanced and, and diffused in uh, industry and society 5.0 applications going forward, where technology will become increasingly uh, intertwined with and responsive to human needs, wants, and, 
and behaviors. Um, so um, regarding universities, uh, this is also one of the uh, four or five strands of the quadruple and quintuple helix. And it is also an area we've been focusing on as an important driver of knowledge, innovation, and entrepreneurial activity. You see here the reference to what we call mode three universities. Now, this is in connection uh, with and, and, and sort of extending the mode one and two knowledge production systems uh, that uh, Novotny and others have developed uh, over the years. Uh, we, we have developed the mode three knowledge production system uh, to under highlight and undergird in a way the uh, quadruple helix framework um, in effect um, to support higher order learning embedded activities and processes embedded in the interactions. And that means we don't just keep doing things in the same manner, just collecting uh, data uh, and producing information and knowledge but also trying to continually improve, enhance, and advance how we filter, analyze, and effectively learn, and even how we improve our learning. That's uh, effectively learning at three levels, uh, and that's the mode three knowledge production system um, that is embedded in this uh, framework, the helix frameworks, quadruple and quintuple for that matter. How can we best advance and finesse our capacity to collaborate, uh, and here we talk about entrepreneurial universities and academic firms, reaching out across, you know, in a way, the institutional divides, whether it's connecting uh, industry and with universities, or government with, with industry or government with universities, and doing so in response to uh, priorities and requirements from the civil society and NGO uh, initiatives for that matter. Um, an example of how this is being uh, applied um, is, in this context, uh, uh, an example from healthcare, uh, looking at economic, social, and environmental impact in terms of value added. And when we design uh, policies or practices and evaluate options and trade-offs, and this is connecting back to the multiple criteria decision analysis that I mentioned before. This is an example of the multiple factors we take into account. And we, we try to obviously optimize along different frontiers. Um, and the other example here is, or the other perspective, is how we engage and involve stakeholders. This is not a mechanistic, uh, again, digital only approach where we collect and analyze and, and synthesize data, but actually looking at the um, nuances and looking at anal analog type of input from humans. So we're talking about brainstorming and focus groups and what have you, where experts and other uh, stakeholders are involved and engaged to provide input and develop consensus whether it's at the highest levels or at other medium and lower levels. This is not just about leadership. Obviously, that starts there, but then that needs also to be connected with the bottom up, as I mentioned earlier. Um, <clears throat> and this is um, how, for instance, one looks at pharmaceutical, biotech, and medical technologies uh parts of the life sciences industry sector and, and what value they add and how that can be optimized to enhance uh, the impact across the different frontiers and the different categories of stakeholders we have in mind so for instance developing accelerating the vaccine uh, <clears throat> development and preparation and diffusion of course uh will benefit uh the, the the creators of that and the pharma and biotech companies involved, but then at the same time, it should also maximize the value added to society. And that unfortunately has not been done optimally, whether it's concerning the governments, but also uh, all of us in a way in how we respond and embrace or not the opportunity for uh, getting truly post pandemic. Uh, we're, we're, we're hesitant on the cusp for some reason and to some extent understandable 
because of the uncertainty and uh, perhaps even lack of proper information and awareness as to the vaccine risks. Um, there is an issue there that persists and will bring us to the fourth wave if it's not already there, maybe the fifth one. So we should talk about post-pandemic with a grain of caution, in my opinion. Um, let's talk about the future nonetheless and talking about the impact of artificial intelligence on our lives. That has been an issue. In fact, it was a big issue right before the pandemic hit and somehow our attention was distracted. Uh, there is going to be, so there's been a disruption due to the pandemic, but that sort of uh, became compounded and combined with the disruption that had started already with artificial intelligence. And this is something uh, that will, uh, is, will continue happening. In fact, in some regard, in my mind, the AI disruption was mitigated or somehow um, buffered by the uh, forced accelerated digitalization due to the pandemic. We became more compatible with more digitalized modes of operation. And this is not just about the people, it's about the organizations, the institutions, and the employers, basically. They were forced to accommodate and, uh, and accelerate the digitalization. And as a result, uh, more people were allowed, had to, in a way, participate in that regard. And that has been a good thing in a way. There's going to be impact on labor and education, not just labor in that regard. Um, the second issue is, uh, or hypothesis, if you wish, is in terms of artificial versus human intelligence. And in that sense, the optimistic view is that they will combine gracefully and there will be a synthesis and synergies. Um, we'll see. And again, this is, this is our view and our hope. Democracy and quality of democracy are a very important enabler of, of this development and a more concrete, if you wish, um, uh, realization of this is in the industry and society 5.0 context that I mentioned. Um, <clears throat> and uh, again, the future will show whether over the medium to long term, uh, autocracies are better suited to drive innovation and entrepreneurship. We think not, but, but we'll see how that plays out. And the question in my mind is more about whether and how democracies are able to uh, confuse themselves and complicate things uh, and appear to be less uh, efficient than autocracies. Uh, the question is how much effective, more effective they can remain to compensate for the lower efficiency compared to what autocracies may do, because the effective aspect of autocracies historically has been the saving grace for democracy. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that's capturing, in a way, uh, you know, going back a few years now, an interview to Scientometrics we gave is that over our belief is that true and transparent democracy is a sine qua non for smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth. Because otherwise, you end up having abuses. You end up having, for instance, the uh, Amazon uh, being uh, burned down and cut down or what have you. Uh, at the same time, as you get um, food and other critical supplies, scarcities grow. Uh, and also, because of climate change, uh, disruptions and destruction in many countries where there is not enough resources to recover, you have increased uh, tendency for polarization. And that further impacts and undermines the opportunity for a more democratic, uh, I guess, uh, regimes and for, for uh, democracy to thrive. Um, in closing, uh, a couple of things uh, I just wanted to share with you if people are interested to some of our ongoing projects. Uh, there is one with Edward Elgar on digital transformation, AI, and innovation in economy, society, and democracy uh, coming up, forthcoming. And then also one on artificial intelligence, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Um, <clears throat> you see the email there. Welcome uh, to re reach out to me, please. And then this is ongoing a project, an encyclopedia of creativity, invention, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Uh, with Springer and then a couple of other books on cyber 
development, democracy, and defense. Democracy being at the center of this. Cybersecurity, in a way, is just a tool. There, there has to be a clear set of objectives why you do things. And that takes me to the quotes from Plato about philosophers and kings and the systems view or systems perspective that needs to be at the, the heart of our mind and the mind of our heart uh, as we look at things to understand the big picture. And since I mentioned uh, you know, Berlin and Central European time before, this is a little poem. Uh, it's been around for a long time, I think from the 19th century. Um, it, of course, had significant, uh, you know, particular significance in the 30s in Germany. The title or the, uh, the motto there is that the thoughts are free. It has relevance today because technology and artificial intelligence uh, applications are becoming increasingly able to not just anticipate our actions or behaviors, but literally read our minds. So even that will no longer be truly free. Um, that's something we should be concerned about. And I conclude here. Thank you for your time and the opportunity.